Hello everyone and welcome to the good old gamer. So it's officially happening. Steam is making another console. This time it is going to be a handheld, which seems to be the new trend in the PC gaming market. We can see that there's clearly a demand for portable x86 gaming PCs, and Steam is the first big player to throw their hat in the ring. Now what's interesting is Steam's using technology that nobody else has at this point in time. Everybody else is using hardware that you typically just see in laptops. It looks like Steam is using a semi-custom design that nobody else can offer. And that's really interesting. So that's what we're gonna be talking about here today in this video. If you are interested in taking your games with you on the go, Steam might actually have the best possible option. But before we get into it, Today's video is sponsored by Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for creators. Explore new skills, deepen existing passions, and get lost in creativity. Skillshare offers classes in just about any profession or hobby, such as illustration, graphic design, photography, video creation, music production, fine art, web development, crafts, whatever you have interest in. For me, a great example would be the DIY cinematography from Ryan Booth. This will allow me to make my videos look better and more movie-like. And best of all, this is a curated community of learning, so there are no ads, and they're always launching new premium classes so that you can stay focused on whatever creativity takes you. And to make things even more affordable than traditional education systems, Skillshare is offering the first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the video description below will gain a one month free trial to Skillshare so that you can start exploring your creativity here today. So with many of us working from home and the PC gaming market being so out of reach for the average person, so you might as well take advantage of this absolutely free offer by clicking that link down in the description below. Now back to the video. All right, so officially the name is the Steam Deck, which I like a lot better than the old Steam Pal, which was like the previous code name. Coming in at only $399, which is actually very good. This is much less expensive than any of the other competing options out there. Now there are more expensive options and I'm going to kind of talk about that. We can see here, they have this nice little image. It looks like it's gonna be very comfortable. You can see how it's kind of gripped down here. Uh, you don't have to buy any extra add-ons. I think that it will feel pretty good in your hands. So let's go ahead and take a look at the specs of this little machine. All right, just to make it easy, I'm gonna jump over here to video cards because they have it all broke down. So this is coming with a uh, Zen 2 four core eight thread CPU between 2.4 and 3.5 gigahertz. And then with eight CUs of RDNA 2, so the latest generation graphics, which we haven't seen at all in any APUs yet, at one gigahertz to 1.6 gigahertz, which is pretty good. And that's coming in at 1.6 teraflops. Not the best overall, but you got to figure that this is probably going to be somewhere close to the RX 470 level, somewhere in that range. And the APU power coming in at 4 to 15 watts. Obviously, 4 would be as if it's hitting its base clocks. And that's really good. That's actually much better than even with the Aya Neo, which is like 15 to like 30 watts. So that's really good. On RAM, 16 gigabytes of LPDDR5, which is interesting um, because this is the first system from AMD to probably use DDR5. And that's coming in at a clock speed of 5,500. So that's faster than the LPDDR4X, which is 4,266. So you got even more memory bandwidth there, which is great. Now the three variants come in, you just get 64 gigabytes of eMMC. So basically that's just meant for the operating system. And then you can throw in your own NVMe if you wanted to. Then of course they offer a 256 gigabyte and a 512 gigabyte. Now for me personally, I don't see any reason why you would want either of these. And we'll talk about that more in a little bit as you can just go ahead and get your own NVMe and slap it in, I'm assuming anyway. Obviously there's no teardowns yet. Now the controls are kind of your standard controller layout. You did see the buttons on the back, which is kind of cool if you want to configure them that way. Now, one of the interesting things for the controls is it does have a gyro, a six axis gyro, so you can get a little bit more accuracy. I don't know if that's gonna be a big deal or not. Personally, I never use that on any device that it's ever been on, but hey, if you like that kind of stuff, it's gonna be there. It does have touch pads, which is really kind of cool. So for games that require, you know, maybe a menu or something where you have to click on some stuff to get the game going before the controller kicks in, 
you don't have to worry about, you know, emulating the mouse and keyboard and stuff on the controller. It'll just go ahead and have its own touchpad. So that's useful, but it does take up space. If we go back to the, the picture here, you can see that these touchpads are quite large and it does make the orientation look a little awkward. I really wish that the left uh, stick here was down a little bit because I kind of like it being on an angle, just like on an Xbox controller. Uh, this is fine because most of the time you're not really using the D-pad if you're using the analog. And if you're using the D-pad, you're usually not using the analog. So this side, it's not too big of a deal. I do wish that this was down maybe half an inch. And this way you kind of have that little angle going on. Personally, that was one of the things that I didn't really like about the Aya Neo is they were like straight up and down. It was a little awkward. I, I kind of like having that angle. All right, so the screen's gonna be a seven inch, 1280 by 800, 16 by 10. That's the exact same thing as the Aya Neo. 60 Hertz, I mean, that's fine. Obviously they gotta keep price under control, touch enable, all that nonsense. Expansion's kind of interesting because of course you do have the NVMe slot, but it also does have a micro uh, SD slot. So if you don't need super fast storage for games, or maybe you have a one terabyte NVMe, but you need more storage for like older games, you can store them on the SD card, you know, where speed's not that big of a deal. So more storage options are good. Now here's the pricing. Now the 64 gig model, which is the one I would recommend, coming in at $399. That's very, very reasonable. It's only $50 more than a Nintendo Switch and significantly uh, you know, more powerful. You can play much more modern games on this and you don't have to buy your games again. So definitely worth a $50 premium. Now, this is what kind of concerns me is the 256 gig model, which a 256 gig SSD only costs about $30 they're charging an additional $130. And then you, for 512 gig, which is only about 50 bucks, they're charging an additional $250. Now you can reserve these. This is why this video is important. Uh, it's tomorrow as of recording, so that'd be 716. And uh, that's at uh, 10 a.m., I believe, Pacific time. So you can kind of figure it out whatever you want. So you can reserve them tomorrow, and then they'll ship in December. Now, if you want to reserve one of these, it's not that expensive. It's only five bucks. So if you're interested in getting one of these, you're going to need to be online tomorrow, ready to go. Uh, personally, I'm going to try to get the 64 gig version. So this way we can test it out here on the channel. So that's what I'm going to go for. If that's not available, I'm honestly not interested in either of these options. All right, so this is all looking good. It's all exciting. $399, really good price point. Now, here's the thing. I don't think anybody's going to be able to really buy these at $399. This, this is going to be the little asterisk. Considering how much more expensive the 256 gig model is, clearly that's the model that Steam is actually making a profit on. And then, of course, the 512 model as well. Probably even more money on that one. So considering they're charging a $100 premium, to give you a $30 SSD, and then uh, what, a $250 premium for a $50 SSD? That lets me know that they're not making any money at $399 or very, very little. So it's gonna be very rare, in my opinion, that anybody's gonna be able to get the $399 model. That's, they might ship like 100 of those and 10,000 of the other ones. I, I think it'll basically be a 100 to 1 ratio. It's just so they can say that they offer a 399 model, and then all the reviewers are going to go, at 399 this is a great deal. Meanwhile, they're not really going to be at 399 Not for a while. I bet you as time goes on and the chips get cheaper and they can get the products cheaper, then they'll eventually increase the supply of the 399 models. But I'm pretty sure at first they're gonna be very rare. Now, I could be wrong. This is just my thoughts and my opinions. I'm going to try to get one, uh, but so is everybody else. Because you can get a one terabyte SSD NVMe for sub $100, uh, which is significantly more space and significantly cheaper than even the 256 gig model. So yeah, that's what most people are going to want to do. So to me, that's just really suspect, and that's my big red flag. So other than that, this looks like a pretty interesting device. It's got a seven inch screen, which is the same size as the Aya Neo that I had, but as you can see, it's much wider, it's longer, it's got that like bigger control, which I think would actually feel better in your hands. But at the same time, seven inches was a bit big for me personally. Honestly, devices like this would be best suited for four or five inches, in my opinion. Now that's gonna differ between everybody out there. 720p or 800p as it is, 
that's plenty resolution. It's going to look fine. In terms of performance, I expect this to probably be close to 50% faster in gaming than something like the Aya Neo, which that device right there, the main reason why I didn't do many more videos on it is because you guys can't really go out and buy them. You can go to Indiegogo and you might get them eventually. So until they're readily available, I just didn't see the point. But that device could literally play any game. Now, you just have to keep turning down settings. Uh, so you go, you know, 720p or 800p low. If you need more performance, all you do is you just turn down uh, basically the internal resolution scaler until it runs well. And ironically enough, because it's such a small screen and pixel density is so high, even at like 50% shading rate, the game basically looks the same. So uh, it's one of those things where it would be fine. Now, this device here, like I said, I'm assuming it's probably going to be close to twice as fast, at least on the graphics side. And that means, for the most part, you should be able to play at native resolution, at least at low settings. You shouldn't have to turn down uh, the internal resolution slider on as many games. Now, on games that ran well on the Aya Neo, which were probably your 2015 era games on back, those didn't really have too much of an issue. Those games will probably run at double the frame rate. So like Witcher 3, I could only get 30 FPS on the Aya Neo. This thing you should be able to get 60 FPS. So that's really excellent that we'll finally have a portable device that'll get 60 FPS in something like Witcher 3. Now, I know there's a lot of people out there going, well, my Nintendo Switch can play Witcher 3. Yes, at well below the lowest PC settings, you can play Witcher 3 at 30 FPS. And I don't even think that game runs at 720p. I think it runs below that because it's dynamic. So <clears throat> with this device, you're going to probably get double the frame rate with better quality settings and higher resolutions for a little bit more money. And Witcher 3 is the impossible port. So I know a lot of people out there are like, ah, oh, Switch is cheaper. No, it's not. Every Switch game is like 50 to $60. Go check out Doom 2016, see how much it is. You can get that on Steam for like 10, 15 bucks. So yeah, just buying games on the Switch just makes it like a two or $3,000 investment minimum. With this device, once you buy it, you have access to your whole library. So it's a $400 to what, $650 device, significantly cheaper than buying a Nintendo Switch, in my opinion, because I have a huge Steam library. Now that lends me over to the operating system. So this is gonna be running Steam OS version 3.0. It's based on Arch Linux. If you guys haven't seen, I did a video on how Linux gaming stands up here today. It's actually quite good. And honestly, I think that's the biggest thing uh, for me from this device. What this is going to do is it's really going to get the community behind Linux gaming. It's gonna show that Steam is capable of running native Windows games very, very well to people out there that are skeptics and have never tried it before. It does a great job and everything runs very well. Now, you're not gonna be able to run all of your games. There are some games that just don't work right now, but the vast majority of games that I tried, like nine out of 10, no problems whatsoever. So that's gonna be great, but eventually if this device is successful, which considering the handheld x86 market has been doing very well, I'm assuming this is going to do well, that means a lot more game developers are going to be interested in natively porting games over to Linux because you do take like a 10 to 25% performance hit using, you know, Wine and using DXVK and all the stuff that Steam's Proton does to make sure that it works on Linux. That hit might be a bigger deal on a device where you're very performance limited. So getting games natively to Linux will get you that performance back and higher profile AAA games will then run better on the Steam Deck. I keep wanting to say Steam Pal. I hated that name, I'm glad they didn't go with it. So, but you know, it's gonna take me a minute to switch in my mind. This information just came out. Regardless, to me this means the entire Linux gaming scene is actually going to get a nice boost. Um, because this is going to be something that developers are going to be paying attention to and going, hey, there's like a million people with this device. We want them to be able to play our game and we want it to run well. So I can see a lot more native Linux ports coming out of this. And right now with Windows 11 coming out, a lot of people being like, I don't wanna really deal with all of Microsoft's crap anymore. Linux gaming is going to probably be in its best position ever to, to actually do a thing because it's actually good. A lot of games run, not all of them. It still needs some work, but the vast majority of PC games will run on Linux. And 
if you if you have a good enough library and you don't have to deal with all the Windows stuff and you have a big company like Valve pushing Linux and they're doing it in a good, smart way, and if the community seems to be getting on board with that, I think that this is the time. If Linux is ever going to have a shot at making any real inroads with gamers, it's going to be right now. So I'm very interested to see how that all shakes out. If you haven't tried Linux with gaming, it's free, guys. You don't have to pay for it. Just, you know, partition off your hard drive a little bit, throw it on there, test it out. It's great. Uh, once again, I'll link my video down below, kind of show you guys some of the basics. Uh, Pop! OS actually just did an update, which actually puts a little bar at the bottom. It looks a lot like Windows 10. It's got the little bar in the middle, and it's super easy to use, guys. All right, so there's a lot of positives. I do see a few potential negatives. Obviously, that's unconfirmed and unsubstantiated at this point. I just don't think that Valve would want to sell the cheapo model when they're trying to make much higher profits on the other ones. So I think they learned from, you know, NVIDIA and AMD, put out a few Founders Editions at the MSRP and then let everybody else sell them for, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50% more money. Uh, and then you'd be like, ah, oh, no, those, those are the extra ones and they got other stuff. It's fine. This thing exists. We sold eight of them. It's fine. So I, I think that they might have learned that PC gamers are, are buying on that one. We'll see. That's just my personal opinion. I'm interested to hear your thoughts on that one down below. But overall, I think that this is a great device. It's going to fulfill a need, and I really hope that this gets other, um, you know, bigger companies out there on board with making almost like console-like x86 PCs. I don't like having to rebuy my games. Being able to take my entire PC library and use it in different form factors at affordable prices is a wonderful thing. So having x86 handhelds sub $500 to me is amazing. I would personally like to see maybe somebody like a Dell. You know, they had that Alienware Alpha. I actually have one over here. It's like Nintendo Wii size machine. That's an awesome little PC. And, you know, I love that form factor. Just nobody's really making them anymore except for, you know, some obscure companies over in China. I really would like to see other, like I said, bigger companies maybe taking some risks, putting out some new products, see how they do. And in a market right now where getting your hands on discrete graphics cards is super hard, obviously that'll get better by the time December rolls around. You know, it's still nice to have other options in the market that might make sense for you. Allow these big companies to source the parts for you and give you more affordable options out there instead of just these pre-built desktops that you're looking at going, I can build a better desktop. I don't want to buy your pre-built. Give me something that I can't build myself. And that's really kind of where I'm at. Give me something that I can't make myself. And I would be interested to checking that out. But alrighty, guys, I'm interested to hear your thoughts down in the comment section below. Are you going to try to reserve one of these things? Do you think it's a cool idea? Do you think the $399 price point is good if you can readily get them, or most people can get them at that price point. Um, I, I can't see anybody defending the $130 price premium for a 256 uh, gigabyte SSD. Now, if you're going to be one of those people, have at it in the comment section, but be warned, uh, most of my viewers are not going to be on board with that. But anyways, guys, interested in your thoughts. If you like videos like this, please smash that like button. Please subscribe. Please share with friends. And if you want to ask questions of me directly over on the Technomics podcast, go ahead and click that join button down below or the Patreon link in the description below. And you also get access to our uncensored after hours podcast that Paul and I do. And the past two of them were like an hour long. So it was like an extra free podcast for members and Patreon members only. So links down below. Thank you so much for your support. And that's really all I have for you guys here today. And I'll catch you guys in the next video.